great lineup of uh, speakers uh, from all over the world uh, to speak on arbitration. Uh, we can do it uh, for sure every time in Moscow. We do our modern arbitration live uh, seminars. So we couldn't miss this uh, great opportunity. Uh, and we decided to dedicate um, the seminar, uh, having such great opportunity, to one of the most interesting uh, questions that is being discussed now in the arbitration society worldwide, uh, to the problem of due process um, paranoia. Uh, I am, would like to say thank you very much to the, uh, our partners uh, of this event, uh, co-organizers, International and Comparative Law Research Center, um, and uh, I wish you, on behalf of Russian Arbitration Center, interesting seminar. I encourage you to ask questions, to discuss, because uh, uh, we have this live uh, in, in the name of, uh, of the seminar. And um, actually, I'm very happy to now pass the word uh, to the moderator of the seminar. Thank you very much, because usually I do this work. Today I can uh, enjoy just the discussion. Uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed uh, Abdel Wahab, uh, founding partner and head of international arbitration, um, uh, chair of private international law and professor of dispute resolution, Cairo University. Um, please, uh, I wish you very interesting work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, I have to say. It's my first visit to St. Petersburg, and it's very impressive, very nice. And uh, even though I was involved in arbitrations involving Russian parties, but it's always either Stockholm or London, so it's very good to be here physically, and I'm very glad. Now, obviously, I have to say the following. This is a very interesting topic, and I promise you nothing less than very interesting discussions with a stellar panel of speakers. Now, what we have to say, just so you know, this panel of speakers are from six countries, from three continents. Tell me how often do you come across such diversity? I think not. Now, I would start by introducing our speakers. First, um, based on what we have, Manuel uh, June Batista, his counsel with Kings and Spalding, Singapore. Of course, very specialized in international arbitration. Then we have Eva Kalina uh, from the Kaufman College, Geneva, doing arbitrator work, obviously. Um, very well known as well. The same, Vasily Kuzintov. Uh, partner Kuzinzov and Marisin and Partners, Moscow. So he's on his home turf. Um, and of course, we've got Krista Soderlund, uh, advocate, senior counsel, uh, Morrising and Nikander from Stockholm, very well known arbitrator, sitting often as well on investment disputes. And then we have uh, Aliona. How do you pronounce the family name? Bitkeska, thank you. Uh, Associate Counsel SIAC Singapore, and we all know the excellent work that SIAC is doing, and they have, you know, achieved one of those top positions amongst arbitral institutions worldwide. Congratulations! Um, and then we have James Menz, uh, Deputy Secretary General and Head of Case Management, DIS Cologne, the most famous German arbitral institutions, who've just had their arbitration, new arbitration rules out, and again doing excellent work in Europe and hopefully beyond shortly. Um, and then. Uh, myself, uh, nothing important there. Um, the idea is we're going to do the following. First of all, the topic of due process. It's one of the very important topics that no one really has given an answer. What do we know? What, it, what does it mean? How can we define due process? That's one thing. So we intend to disambiguate that in a few minutes, but then we'll focus the discussion on the diverse aspects, so we will deconstruct due process in a way, addressing what happens in the proceedings from the perspective of counsel, arbitral institutions, and arbitrators. And then in the third part, we'll address the reactions to due process, what should arbitral institutions and arbitrators do. So what we intend to do is to have a sort of a Q&A that has been uh, agreed amongst the panel, and then we we'll open the floor for discussion. So I encourage you, of course, to participate, take note of whatever uh, questions or points that you wish to share with us. We very much wish to exchange experiences in this respect. Um, and so, uh, to start, I think um, we would start by the due process clarified or disambiguated, and then I invite my colleagues to share their views on what do they think uh, due process is about. June, do you have a, a view on that? Theoretically, yes. Uh, we don't know what 
due process is, is all about. It's basically um, having both parties be able to present their case. Um, but of course, that's just the theory. In, in practice, what does that actually mean? Um, I think it's, you know, it's one of those, you know it when you see it kind of thing. Um, so it's not absolute equality. It's just being able to present your case. But what that actually means is, I guess, on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because here due process is normally, I think it's one of the most frequently invoked things in international arbitration. In fact, some call it the procedural dimension of, due, of public policy, which is the most commonly invoked ground, but the least successful in many jurisdictions. So it, it is interesting uh, what Jun has mentioned. Do any others, any of uh, our panelists have any view about a different angle of due process? I think another angle of due process can be fair attitude of the adjudicator, of an arbitrator towards the council position because if we're talking about the right to present the case, then it's well procedural aspect of your process. But the question is, okay, you you do have opportunity to present your case, to draft submissions, to 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 put them before the tribunal. You can cross-examine a witness. You can take your time in oral submissions. But if the panel is not fair, then then well, can you say that it's due process? I think I think fair attitude is also is also a must here. Krista. Well, it is, uh, yes, in many cases, uh, the principle is undisputed and uh, not controversial in any way. But uh, when you come to uh, uh, real life, uh, then the difficulties begin because the um, devil is in the details. So uh, the question is if a, a party is uh, exercising some uh, senseless uh, in witness investigation, which everyone... Uh, investigate or the questioner realizes will bring uh, uh, that party's interests nowhere, continues for hours, where should you draw a line without um, encroaching upon the principle of the process? There uh, you meet all these uh, extremely difficult uh, um, decisions where there is no uh, uh, ideal solution but where there will be a compromise in one or the other di direction. Thank you. Aliona? Uh, maybe just from the institutional perspective. So we look at due process as ensuring that the procedure which has been agreed by the parties is followed, right? So in that regard, we can mention the appointment process. Because if we do not have the tribunal constituted according to what has been agreed by the parties, potentially we have a due process violation. That's probably one of the aspects. That's a very interesting point, the procedure agreed by the parties. Right? Well, the way due process is broken down in uh, continental European uh, ling language may be helpful because they, they break it into the right to be heard and equal treatment. So there are two different concepts that, at least under the American terminology, are commingled into one, and um, both are essential to w the integrity of the procedure. And I think that is the key, in ensuring that the procedure is, uh, f uh, is um, safeguarded and followed in an integral way, and for the institutions, that is usually at the beginning and at the end of the, um, the arbitration. Um, and so the institutions also are under a duty to ensure um, that due process and all the facets of due process are respected. Thank you. We will come to that. And I, th I think the French would add another dimension, which is called the principe de contradiction, or the principle of contradiction, adversariality, which means that the party is, again, part of the right to be heard. So I it's interesting. I think let's dig deep into that and take more of an, a, a micro analysis of what due process paranoia, if we deconstruct it, involves. And here we will follow what we have in terms of council perspective, arbitrator perspective, and institutional perspective. So let me start with the uh, institutional perspective, and I ask our leading um, institutional representatives here. Um, do you encounter due process allegations or breach of due process when it comes to institutional decisions regarding case registration, processing or determination of challenges, inadmissibility of counterclaims if the fees are not paid, but of course the, the arbitrators would do that, but would institutions instruct arbitrators not to proceed if payment has not been made one or the other. What are the most common institutional challenges that you face in relation to due process? Perhaps uh, Aliona and uh, Jake. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, the most 
common in terms of the number, I would say, is the um, uh, objection to the appointment of arbitrators. And so he, uh, the institution, uh, ours as do many others, um, decides when an arbitrator is nominated and, and the other party objects against the appointment of that arbitrator based on the lack of independence usually. And so um, this is a stage at which the institution decides on that challenge based on um, usually uh, you know, international best practice. And uh, due process uh, must be followed in terms of the common period, for example, in terms of the, um, the opportunity to uh, rebut uh, certain propositions and so forth. The other um, element, I would say, is the setting of deadlines prior to the appointment of the tribunal itself. So we can talk, we can, uh, this covers um, the deadlines for submissions, the deadlines for uh, common periods, um, and, uh, and other things. The admissibility of claims, it's rarer because um, depending on the applicable rules, um, this, is either, um, this is either something that the tribunal deals with or um, it is not um, something that bars it, um, that prevents the arbitration from proceeding. It may not even be a final decision. Um, so we don't usually have that problem. Um, the, the final point that I might add under our new rules um, will be the, um, the determination of, um, of certain other procedural aspects later in the arbitration. Uh, and especially um, under our new rules, you can now have a decision on the amount in dispute if you disagree with the uh, tribunal's determination. You can, also, um, uh, you can also challenge certain other administrative decisions. You can file requests for challenge, obviously, as you could under many other rules uh, heretofore. And here, um, we have introduced a provision which some people have, have praised, uh, and, and in other institutions you have it as a matter of course, uh, some don't, that the arbitration can continue during a challenge. And I think this is something that, from a due process paranoia point of view, is very, very important. Um, but as an institution, we are also at risk of this phenomenon, um, perhaps even more so than I would posit than arbitrators. Um, paranoia, in my understanding, means the fear of being set aside and losing the award at the end because of a decision you've made. And as an institution, because um, many of your decisions actually are not challengeable uh, before a final court of instance, I think you may be even more aware and more afraid of this phenomenon, more from a reputational point of view than from a legal point of view. But I, that, that's a, sort of a, pr a proposition I'm putting out there for others to comment on. Thank you. So, just maybe quickly, there's a lot happening uh, prior to the constitution of the tribunal. So we have a lot of due process concerns which I traders will be ready to address. But from the institutional perspective, you have uh, a couple of important stages. You have the commencement of arbitration, you have certain interlocutory applications. You can have applications for consolidation, for joinder, for your arbitration proceedings to be conducted in the expedited procedure, as well you can have jurisdictional objections. And whenever that particular application is being made as an institution, what we try to ensure is that each and every party is given a right to submit on that particular application. Because even before you have your tribunal appointed, you can have certain very important decisions being uh, taken, like where are you, whether you have one arbitration or you have two arbitrations. And at the end of the day, that can have an impact on the enforceability of a word as well. I believe from institutional perspective, we do have to ensure that even prior to the appointment of the tribunal, the other party is given the right to be heard. What happens after the appointment of the tribunal, challenges to the arbitrators, as well as the uh, early dismissals of claims and defenses, I think we can touch upon that later. Thank you. So just one point before we take it with the arbitrators and counsel for the institutions. You mentioned that before the constitution of the tribunal, let me discuss with you, for example, some institutions have a confirmation um, of a nomination by an arbitrator. Now, where do you draw the line if there is an objection by one of the party over the nomination of an arbitrator. You get the arbitrator to respond, the other party to respond. And then we find that the party that initiated the objection responds again. And then you invite the others to respond. Where do you stop the cycle? And the, at, at any moment you stop that cycle, you will always find a party objecting. Uh, actually, a great question. Uh, it's probably... 
Because at the end of the day, you can't have uh, submissions being made indefinitely. But what you have to ensure is that you have submissions, sub uh, sufficient submissions to make a reasonable decision. So in this particular case, most of go through a single round of submissions. We're probably talking at least a couple of rounds. We can fool the OK, thank you. Is it the same in the DIS? Usually two rounds and shorter deadlines for the second round, and exceptionally if a third round is requested, very short deadlines for the third round. And by setting these short deadlines, you get less material and usually um, less desire to have yet another round. Usually the arguments after the first round are already quite clear. The good news is that at that early stage, there's only so much you can say, uh, as opposed to later on in the briefs. Thank you. Of course, it depends on the jurisdiction and the region, because in some regions, people will not put everything in the first round and will put in the second round, and then the response from the arbitrator would provoke further questions and information. So, but it's interesting. Eva, yeah, I was going to come to you, actually. Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Is this working? Or am I just being very loud? Um, no. No. <laughs> Neither. OK. Um, so I thought about the session, and I thought, how would I introduce myself? And I thought I would say, my name is Eva Kalina. I'm an arbitrator, and I suffer from due process paranoia, which sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> um, but jokes aside, in fact, I did reflect upon the issues of due process issues in preparation for this session. And only in the last 10 days, I counted about five. Um, just to briefly run through the list, and we will go into more detail, I believe, on all of them. But just within the last 10 days, I had an objection with respect to Skype testimony. I had, aside from the usual requests for extensions of deadlines, a request to submit evidence at the end of the hearing and to move the deadline for the post-hearing briefs. A request to move the actual hearing because a key witness has been hospitalized. And in another case, the whole tribunal was challenged, which goes back to the institutional perspective, because the um, respondent initially was not participating in the proceedings, and so the entire tribunal was appointed by the institution. And once the respondent decided to finally participate, it decided to challenge the whole tribunal. So, um, and I could go on, <laughs> but I will not for the time being. But just as my very first observation, certainly due process paranoia is something that arbitrators need to deal with regularly. But just to attack the very term due process paranoia, I mean, it clearly indicates that it is something negative, right? Paranoia is not a positive thing, and arbitrators are at fault. So I was wondering why we, we could as well entitle the session Abuse of Due Process by the Parties. Because it really depends on which side you're on that you do not want, you, you want the efficient arbitrator that does not give in to um, um, unjustified requests by the other side unless you are actually the party benefiting from it. So just to put things into perspective. Thank you. You're sitting between two councils, so you have to be careful because I will ask June and Vasily to comment on what you say. But let me put this question to you and then Krista can weigh in. As an arbitrator, would you give parties equal time on everything? And if no, why and when? Chris, you want to start and then Eva? Uh, okay, uh, the answer is uh, no. Uh, the principle um, um, about equal treatment, uh, as the other principles are, uh, is easy to understand and uncontroversial. The problem is only that parties are not equal. They don't behave in an equal way. They ha don't have to uh, argue uh, equal issues. Uh, they have different roles already as claimant and respondent, which usually is the, the, the uh, situation. So, so that's uh, the first problem. And uh, when one goes to um, seminars on arbitration, uh, there is a lot of sensitivity about uh, minor issues that you should uh, consider this, or you should be um, attentive to this, or you should uh, deal with this in this order and um, uh, in this or that way, or the award will be set aside. Uh, but that is actually not the case. Uh, 
if you are acting in a uh, arbitral seat with uh, a reasonable tradition of not to uh, uh, easily and lightheartedly setting aside awards, and, and we have a lot of those seats uh, around the globe, then uh, you, you can, as an arbitrator, be rather uh, robust in uh, dealing with uh, uh, the procedure uh, from the point of view of setting aside. Uh, or, or endangering the uh, award uh, from future attack. But then, um, having said that, it's not certain that you should be so robust because, after all, uh, you are serving uh, the parties who are picking up the tab and uh, you are resolving their dispute and uh, there may be a uh, call for flexibility for other reasons uh, and this doesn't make things easier. But to, to come to your question, uh, one thing that uh, parties uh, have a, an uh, exaggerated uh, view on is the equal sharing of time. Uh, if you have the situation where the claimant wants uh, a week uh, uh, additionally uh, to submit a brief, uh, the other party will uh, without a doubt uh, require uh, uh, a week's extension for his future uh, submission somewhere in a distant uh, uh, future uh, <coughs> uh, automatically and uh, <coughs> then um, uh, this is uh, absolutely not uh, based in any rational uh, approach to the need to uh, equal treatment and uh, there is uh, a, a more important um, consideration of course that parties may need different uh, time frames if you have a uh, very plain uh, principal claim, unpaid invoices, that's no big deal. You don't need uh, many days to, to explain what you are after. But perhaps the respondent has a counterclaim or a set of claim based on very uh, intricate uh, and very uh, lofty uh, philosophies about uh, damages then that party will need more time because those issues will require more uh, uh, review and argument. So, um, but but uh, equal time is, is not necessary, uh, but it is something which is perceived by the parties to, uh, to be an indispensable requirement for, uh, uh, for due, process, due process. Also, this goes for the hearings. It's very important that if a party gets a certain um, time slot, it should not be ex extended without the other party getting uh, a corresponding time slot. And that is based on a rather curious uh, perception that one thinks that the more I speak, the better my case will be. Uh, occasionally, it can be absolutely the opposite. Uh, and if you have a good case, you may not need to uh, present it for days on end. Uh, so so um, uh, the time factor, whether you have a certain um, time slot or a more extended um, framework for your oral presentations, that may not at all impact on the uh, considerations of due process. So um, okay. uh, that's uh, okay. one thing. Yeah. Thank or you. two things. Uh. Yeah. Eva, wh what's your view? And perhaps in your answer, based on what Christopher has kindly shared with us, you would also address the scenario where a part put forwards five witnesses and the other puts 20. Would you allocate time? Normally, counsel would fight over that. And I want counsel to challenge the arbitrators <laughs> on their findings <laughs> in this respect. I actually had this example in mind, but just by introduction. So the issue of equality of time arises at the macro level and a micro level. So first, as um, my colleague already mentioned, for example, in investment arbitration, if you have a state and an investor, states are known to usually require more time, and it is quite obvious as well, because um, you're dealing with public entities, things like document production, other things, it's more difficult perhaps to obtain approval from the client. Um, so that's already one difference. Um, similarly, you can have, say, a consumer arbitration where you have 
um, a consumer that's being represented by a sole practitioner that has never done arbitration before and a big company on the other side. And then certainly then you need to be a little bit aware that there's not an inherent equality of arms from the start. Now on the micro level, during hearing, usually the basic rule is that each party is allocated the same amount of time at the hearing, but certainly, as you already mentioned, different circumstances arise in practice that the arbitrator simply cannot ignore. Number one is translation. And sometimes, with some languages, and I have had arbitrations, for example, um, in Russian and Chinese, where um, simultaneous translation is not possible, so it's consecutive translation. So obviously, you need to account for the time that a party uses on translation. And similarly, the witnesses. Um, certainly, um, if one party has many more witnesses than the other, then that party may be allocated more time. Now, obviously, it will depend on the circumstances. Um, recently, I was involved in a dispute about this. So, for example, um, there's so many factual scenarios. Uh, the, well, the first question to ask, why does the other party have more witnesses? Is it because of the arguments raised by the other party, etc.? You always need to strike a balance. We can't really discuss this in a vacuum. Um, but just to end on a couple of practical points about time extension. So number one, the first procedural order number one and the timetable. I think it, the tribunal has a lot of power really right from the start to set things right. And even during the first discussion as the timetable is being discussed, I think it is the arbitrator's duty to make the parties aware of the deadlines, because sometimes it's really quite obvious that if there's no leeway at all, there's no flexibility in the timetable, it very rarely happens that no extension ever is requested. So again, you know, an open discussion, will this be sufficient time? Have you considered the extensions? Have you considered um, a number of issues? So that's number one. Number two, um, and uh, my colleague also mentioned that, that's just a practical tip for the council in the room. Um, you may or you may not know, but I'm surprised how often counsel do not know that if a party, if your opponent asks for a one week extension, you're actually entitled to two weeks. It's, it's an obvious thing because obviously, let's say if the party asks statement of claim and that's moved by two weeks, then you're not entitled only to two weeks, you're actually entitled to the time that you're also missing to respond in between. Um, that's just a practical tip. It's, a, it's an excellent point that I faced last week in a case uh, in England where I am um, leading one of the council team for one of the parties and, and one party requested an extension which we objected to, the tribunal gave them one week and amended the timetable giving us one week, mm -hmm. not two. So there was a moment of silence, and I wrote to the tribunal saying that there was a typographical error, <laughs> because you have to address the tribunal one way or the other. And uh, the chairman is, you know, amazingly nice guy, said, no, it's not a typographical error, it's simply because of my lack of mathematical understanding of some points. You're right, you should get two weeks, not one. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, but that's a very interesting point. Now, going, June and uh, Vasily, what do you think? I mean, if you're acting as counsel and arbitrators do not allocate time, in fact, Eva said if party presents more witnesses, it gets more time. I would have thought that the other party would get more time because they're going to cross-examine the witnesses. But That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I've been in that situation before where the other side had about twice as many witnesses than, than we did, so we needed more time to cross-examine. Um, initially, we were going for uh, like a 65-35 split. Uh, the other side objected. Uh, uh, so we, so, so it, it, you know, so and we actually had to go to the tribunal uh, at, because we couldn't agree. Um, so I do understand where um, arbitrators would be coming from uh, with respect to uh, not necessarily giving parties equal time. It really will depend on, on you know, uh, in, in that case, they had so many witnesses because not everyone had uh, perfect knowledge with respect to all the issues. So, I mean, th that's, that's not their fault. Okay. 
Um, with respect to the inherent imbalance between, let's say, states and, states and um, investors, uh, well, I think my law firm generally represents uh, claimants more, more so than, than states. So, I, I mean, we do realize that uh, states may take time to, to get their act together, but at the same time, that delay does cause problems for claimants. Um, you know, uh, actually, that, that's actually happening in one of my cases at the moment, and I, and I can't really talk about it because it's, it's, it hasn't really entered the public domain yet. Would you agree to a shorter deadline then? I've seen cases where the claimants are quite happy to have even a month for a statement of claim and they nonetheless let the state have two. So you're passing the risk to the claimants. Okay, you're pro-state. <laughs> I mean, provided you agree. Yeah. Mm, I mean, I think in theory, yes, but again, depending on just how complex this case is, um, maybe not, because again, it, it, then that would create, an, you know, it's just, you know, we ourselves also have to talk to witnesses, do the research. It's, it's not that the state is the only one which has the monopoly of problems. We also do. So, you know, okay. our clients also. So, you know, again, I like the idea. I, I think if, 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 if it's probably without prejudice to maybe we'll agree to yes one month, but then, okay, if we already see that we're going to have problems with the month and we'll let the tribunal and the other side know. But of course, the problem with that is then your entire calendar might move because if we ask for another extension, then that creates all sorts of problems now down the road. Okay. So June, one point on the allocation in the case you mentioned, 6535 of the time. And normally sometimes you get a package, you assign whatever minutes you want to each witness or whatever. So you agree initially that you will have 20 witnesses to cross-examine so you get 60% of the time, the other party gets 40%. And then as the hearing gets closer, you decide not to cross-examine yes. witnesses and then use the time allocated to you for oral pleadings. Now how would arbitrators see that? How would opposing counsel perceive this? Was it a tactic by counsel? to ask for more time and then not use it for the witnesses, but use it for other purposes? Is that, is that an issue? Uh, for the cases that I've had, it's usually quite set. So the tribunal would usually set in advance, okay, day one we're gonna have oral argument, like jurisdiction or opening statements, things like that. Day two we'll have cross-examination, day three, day four, day five, and then we'll have closing. So you don't really have that, if you choose not to cross-examine certain witnesses, you can't then so use that, yes. Okay, I've just faced that in, in one of the cases as a, sitting as an arbitrator where the parties agreed on allocation of time, we had hearing dates, but then the party decided not to cross-examine and said I'm using my time, the tribunal has given us this lot, and we're using it the way we think is appropriate. Krista, you wanted some? Cheeky. Stuff? Yes, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I come back to this idea I have that if you have more time for pleadings, uh, it's not at all certain yeah. that your case will be better. Vasily, uh, do you have a view from counsel as to what the arbitrators uh, do? I think it's, it's quite funny because if you are counsel in an arbitration, then to some extent you are acting in two roles. Because externally you are acting as counsel, and internally with your client you are acting more like a sort of adjudicator, more like an arbitrator. So it means that externally you take your client's position, you defend it, and if you were to defend your client's position, you need to really believe in what you are saying, otherwise the tribunal will understand that, well, it's, it's not something uh, in which you really believe and they can just dismiss your argument. And in, in this regard, what you think and what you say is determined by your client's interests. So, for example, this this good point about one week extension and corresponding two week extension for uh, for the other side. So, um, if the other side is seeking extension, then of course we will argue, and we have argued this that we would be entitled to two week extension. That's right. But if we will be uh, asking for an extension, then uh, you can think about. Uh, 
a range of arguments why they should not be entitled to two weeks, but only to one week. For example, you can say that, well, guys, you've got three months for your next submission, so one week less or one week more, it, it will not be a decisive factor. So let's stick to the original timetable. You will have your three months, and if you need a one-week extension, then we can decide it closer to the filing date. So is it okay. an approach? It's, it's quite an approach. Or another argument which we made uh, recently is that, uh, well, it's not just one submission. We have a series of submissions. So if we get a one-week extension for the first submission, uh, you, the other side, you get also a one-week extension for your submission. It means that we will have one week less for our second submission. So to some extent, we will be punished because we will have less time for our second, for our second shot. And again, if you look at it objectively, it can be quite an approach. Um, James, when he spoke about approach of the institutions to challenges, it resonated with, with our experience because if, imagine that a party makes an early challenge to an arbitrator. So then the institution will typically resolve the challenge. And it's, 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 uh, it's quite, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, understandable why an institution will be quite careful in this regard because James correctly said that it's, it's not appealable and typically it will be reviewed only at the set aside state or at the enforcement state, uh, stage whether the particular arbitrator should have been challenged or not. And then uh, if you are challenging an arbitrator at an early stage, then your line of arguments could be that it's quite early, guys, let's not uh, poison the entire process, let's not risk any, ar any arguments at the challenge state or set aside stage or enforcement stage, so let's replace this arbitrator and then have a smooth and, and, and good arbitration. But if you are defending your arbitrate against this early challenge, then the question is that, well, why my arbitrator should, should go away? The right to nominate an arbitrator, it's, it's uh, a cornerstone of the international arbitration. This is the nature of the arbitration, that you can select your arbitrator. So you selected your arbitrator, and only because the challenge is made early, he should, he should go away. Is, is it fair for the defendant side? It's, well, it's, it's quite difficult to, uh, to, to really reach a balance here. But uh, returning back to the original idea, if you, are, if you are a counsel externally, then with the clients, you act more like an arbitrator because you need to find logic beh behind the arbitrator's decision. And you need to understand whether the panel is, well, fair or not fair or not quite fair, what the approach the panel will take to other issues. So when you talk to your client, you need to be more objective, of course, than when you talk externally. That's, that's what yeah. I think. Now, we have a lot of questions. So for the coming ones, we need to limit ourselves to a minute or two so that not just you, no, no, no. But to, to limit it too, because we, we have a lot of interesting topics and we want our audience and participants to, to share their views as well. But on this, quickly, Vasily, so in Russian seated arbitration, so if you have arbitration seated in Russia, are you telling us that equal time is not a manifestation of due pro a breach of due process? I mean, it's not, it's not a requirement. I think, I think we will be quite flexible. The, okay. I think the starting point is that Everyone should have equal time, but, well, it can, it can depend. Okay, perfect. Now, moving on to the next question, and again, in a, in a brief, uh, let's say, bullet uh, points, who speaks last and on what? I mean, that's, that's always an interesting point. You have claimant and respondent in arbitrations. Everyone, at least in most of the jurisdictions that come across, respondent wants to speak last. But then they trade places because certain applications can be made by respondent, where claimant would say, I want to speak last. Now, first of all, briefly, how do institutions deal with applications presented to the institutions about who speaks last? Is that something that you factor in when you address these points, Aliona? Uh, yes, absolutely. There's always that principle that you would like the party to respond. But as previously mentioned, it's a question of balance and getting the full picture of submissions. So as long as uh, each and every party has a right to say uh, that's sufficient for an institution to make a reasonable decision. So I think that paranoia, that whole principle of I'm entitled to last word, is sometimes uh, over-pushed, so to speak. Indeed. James? We try, we try to 
try to limit this problem by, by really setting quite ambitious deadlines. I think it, it helps. It focuses everyone's mind. It shortens the submissions. And I think it usually allows a reasonable um, exercise of the right to be heard. That may be a little bit of a cop out. Um, it, ten, it tends to be less of a problem because you usually don't have counterclaims. So it's pretty clear in the procedural decisions that institutions make who um, should have the last word because there's, there's an applicant and there's a respondent on any given procedural question. Okay, so it's based on application, not the standing in the arbitration as claimant or respondent. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Now, for the arbitrators, are you troubled by these questions of who speaks last? Do you observe that or is that something not of major importance to you? <coughs> My problem is that uh, all arbitrations have been very friendly and uh, the party council have acted in a very uh, loyal and very disciplined way. So there have not been any guerrilla tactics or, uh, or arguments about uh, unnecessary such uh, technicalities. Uh, You're quite fortunate, Krista. We should bring you to other perhaps. parts of the world quite often then. Yeah, okay. There are horror stories. Okay. I think it uh, comes back to, to, to the, uh, uh, as you talked about, the uh, initial planning of the whole proceedings, uh, uh, because uh, that's the ideal uh, uh, or opportunity to, to um, seek um, uh, agreement on, on all these issues why the parties are still uh, trying to make a good impression on the arbitrators and, and show some sort of token uh, cooperation. Um, so, so um, and that will uh, always follow the usual routine of two or three rounds and, um, and um, this has not been an issue uh, that I recall has ever created a uh, problem. Uh, of course, if there is a novel issue um, uh, raised at a late stage, it's the normal debate about whether it should be allowed and if it were to be allowed, uh, should there be further submission? But that's sort of Thank you. Routine. Eva, yes? Um, usually it's not an issue. Obviously, arbitrators need to get the math straight and sometimes when your requests keep coming in just to make sure that each party has um, the same amount of rounds to come and beat in a procedural request and let alone when it comes to the substantive um, submissions. Um, the issue of who speaks last sometimes does arise in hearings and that's interesting and again I'm going back to what I said before it's important for the tribunal to clarify these things to discuss these things during the first case management conference because there are different preferences there are different cultural backgrounds and it's important to air this right away so when it comes to cross-examination, I suppose all of us are used to direct examination, which, by the way, needs to be usually uh, quite brief, although in a recent case, again, um, a party that was not of an Anglo-Saxon and not even continental background um, had interpreted the direct examination as a very lengthy um, way of the witness to present his views of the case. So we have direct, then we have cross, then we have redirect, and sometimes, and again, this is something that needs to be discussed right away, recross. Another question that arises is then, depending on the type of tribunal you have, an active or less active, when the tribunal starts asking parties the questions. Usually, uh, um, that is done at the end of the cross-examination because, and I think, well, personally, I think that's the right way because if the tribunal interrupts the parties right in the middle, then sometimes it can, you know, mess up the counsel's whole path of cross-examination. The question is then, can counsel ask further questions that stem from the tribunal's questions? Okay. So yeah. that's where the question arises, Thank who you. speaks last? Now, for counsel, June or Vasily, if you wish to disagree on anything, let's do it this way then. Do you disagree with what the arbitrators said or not? On the uh, who speaks last, I find that it's less of an issue with respect to formal submissions. I, it, that usually, I think, becomes an issue, but again, it's still seldom. When you have you know, uh, issues which prop up based on things that are happening, for instance, the other side is doing something and you want to bring that to the attention of of the tribunal, and then of course yeah. the other side will try to explain and 
uh, but usually I think uh, parties will be quite reasonable because you also don't want to look bad in front of the tribunal. And also, these things also take a lot of time and money. So again, you sort well, of discipline yourself. Of course, but define how you don't want to look bad. I mean, looking bad is, is not a one size fits all. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a, and you know, both counsel might sometimes, or both parties might be acting erratically in a way that acting bad is not really a feature or manifestation of one party, but more than one. And, and one essential question that I mean, an issue that I faced in a case as an arbitrator is basically who speaks last? Is it a function of the whole proceeding or each phase and procedural point of the arbitration? And that's, that's the tricky part because one party will come and tell you, you know, I speak last. We are not yet in the post-hearing submissions phase. We are not even in the hearing. You will have a chance to speak and address that. So do you, uh, do you as counsel of Vasily, think that you should do that in relation to the procedure at large or each part or aspect of the procedure on its own? I would say it's usually, uh, at least in my practice, uh, resolved uh, on a face-to-face -face basis. So okay. the one issue is written submissions, the other thing is oral submissions at the hearing. Uh, I would say that, um, at least in my experience, there is not much dispute about sequence of presentations at the hearing. Usually parties agree between each other. We've got lengthy debates about who has the last word in written submissions. And at least in our practice, that's important because it's actually about who is the last to supply evidence, okay. which is crucial. Uh, in English style uh, arbitration, as we call it, the claimant has the last word. It's statement of claim, statement of defense, and then statement of reply. So claimant is the last. In memorial style uh, arbitration submissions, it's respondent who has the last word. So we would decide on a case by case basis how we would like to structure it. Uh, even if we as respondent uh, happen not to have the last word, uh, we would usually try to remedy that through other ways, for example, through an extension of time for our submission. So we will say to the tribunal, well, look, guys, uh, they have the last word. We have just one month for our statement of defense. It's not enough. We need more because it will be our only chance to supply evidence for you. Thank you. Now, moving to another point, and let's start by counsel this time, not arbitrators. Last minute inclusion of evidence. So here you go, the scenario. The parties have exhausted the rounds of submission, be it one or two rounds. They go to the hearing. One party surprises the other with evidence that they wish to put on record, or even before the hearing, a couple of days, or well before, they wish to include evidence. Or even after the hearing, when the tribunal said that no further evidence is needed, you'll find last minute inclusion of evidence. And I'm sure counsel, if they wish to submit the evidence, will defend that. If they are the opposite party, they will definitely object to that. So what's, counsel, what's counsel's view on this? Should you be allowed to submit evidence last minute as long as the proceedings are not closed? Or should you not? Do you take into consideration the seat or the jurisdiction? Because in some jurisdictions, as long as the proceedings are not closed, the still the game is on. So how would you deal with that? June. Briefly. I guess it depends on which side I'm on. Um, but it has happened to me. I, I've been on both sides of, of, of yeah. the problem. Uh, and uh, the tribunal actually, in, in one of those cases, allowed our side to give the last minute evidence, although we actually had to defend ourselves. And so we said, actually, we're just responding to the other side's uh, evidence. And we're now trying to contra you know, basically uh, refute that evidence, so that's why it's last minute. Uh, Even if it's beyond the cutoff date, where you've had time to uh, put in evidence and you did not comply? No, so what had happened was they were respondent, were claimants, so there were rounds. Okay. So when they, during the last round, that we saw the evidence and then we said, well, actually, that's, we're going to dispute that. Here's our evidence. And so the other side complained that, no, no, you're out of time. And we said, well, no, we need to challenge your evidence. Okay. So there was a bit of a uh, tussle over that, but we eventually got our way. We've also had the situation where the other side, after the hearing and after post-hearing brief, briefs, decided to uh, submit more evidence. We objected to that. 
Now, the arbitrators could correct me, but I think there is, seems to be an inclination that arbitrators, once they hear both parties, will be inclined to admit the evidence and allow the other party to respond so that they exhaust this. But are there situations where arbitrators would be robust, saying, no, this evidence is inadmissible procedurally? Eva, what do you think, then, Krista? Mm -hmm. Well, I just had this issue <laughs> last week. Good. <laughs> no, so, um, you already mentioned there are a number of things to consider. Has there been a cutoff date? Is it after the cutoff date? Is it after the proceedings have been closed? Um, is it necessary? What do the rules say about that? Let's not forget the institutional side as well, because the institutional rules might provide quite some significant guidance. And, um, but they leave this all to the tribunal. Most of the institutional rules would say the evidence, admissibility, weight, it's everything for the And that's for the exactly why we refer to the rules, right? To yeah. just confirm we have discretion, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, you so. also look at the date of the evidence. So it's not new, but has been there a year or a couple of years, and you're submitting it now? Well, well, definitely. The explanation why it's coming late is essential. If it's just simply a legal authority, and there's absolutely no explanation why the council could have done the research before, then that's one aspect. If, in your scenario, or if, for example, this is something that truly arose at the hearing, sometimes it's really also as a result of the tribunal's questioning, then then that's a different scenario. Okay. That's, so that's, that's But for me, yeah. generally, I would say, as the rule of thumb, it's the balance of prejudice. I think um, that's really essential to me. Um, Do which you party yeah. will suffer more prejudice? Does this prejudice of me admitting this evidence and the party that objects to it outweighs the prejudice to the party if I do not admit this perhaps essential piece of evidence. Okay, and Krista, is it, do you agree with Eva that it's the balance of prejudice, which is not easy for the tribunal to manage unless they are prepared and well read into everything, or is it really the tribunal wants to spare themselves the hassle? Okay, let them put forward what they wish and then the other party can respond so that we pass and move on to the next phase. What do you think? Well, it's, it's, it's very irritating with uh, this kind of situation because many times you see that this evidence is absolutely worthless and still there is a big fight about it, about it this way or that way mm -hmm. and you can threaten that this will have cost implications irrespective of the outcome but that uh, is usually not so okay. uh, persuasive. So, so it's a difficult situation. I usually tend to be a little uh, kind which uh, is not to be commended. Okay. Now, briefly, before we move to the reactions to due process, which I think we have a number of issues to discuss there, but what about limiting having word limits for written memorials? Uh, especially it happens in post-hearing briefs. Um, or maybe in submissions, they say, your memorial will not exceed, let's say, 60,000 or 50,000 words. Do you use that as an arbitrator? Do you use that or you leave it to the parties to have the memorials as they wish? No. I've never been uh, close to that uh, idea, um, but it is a problem because um, uh, party council tends to fi file longer and longer briefs. In the old days it was 65 pages, now it's uh, four, uh, 375. And of course this is a development, I think, because you have uh, more and more resourceful firms uh, with very uh, ambitious and uh, talented young people spending 20 hours a day, a day uh, preparing these, uh, these submissions. And, it, uh, and it's also from an economic point of view and the leverage you, you obtain a, a very, very uh, interesting proposition. So, so uh, you have uh, st uh, staffed uh, larger and larger teams on each side, but the uh, arbitrate, uh, the tribunal is still only three lonely people who are getting this yeah. onslaught. But they are papers. the three with the big minds that everyone looks up no. to to resolve their case. No, and they the yeah. risk is yeah, that you, you actually might uh, miss a point yeah. on page 299. <laughs> it, it could <laughs> be so. So it is not necessarily so that these enormous yeah. submissions are optimal. 
Thank you. When it comes to page limits, I think it's always a good practice to try to get the parties to agree because at least, again, in my experience, it's surprising how much the parties, especially if they're, they're represented by professional counsel, can actually agree without the tribunal imposing anything. Now, when it comes to, usually it's the page numbers. Um, the only thing I do add is that if it's a page numbers, then do not start playing with the fonts, you know? Yeah. <laughs> do not go into the squeeze and, you know, font 10. Um, but usually, again, I get the parties to agree. But, you know, if the parties can agree on this stuff, we wouldn't have had our panel today because there wouldn't be a due process paranoia. Everyone is acting reasonably. The fact remains that you may have... I've had in one case where the presiding arbiter tell, you know, the parties could agree, and I encourage them to do so, on the page, on the word limit. Uh, because if you don't agree, I have my own word limit in my procedural order. So the idea is not whether the word limit would be agreed in principle or not, it's the question of what the word limit is. And that is, in some jurisdictions, might be problematic, especially jurisdictions that are not well versed in international arbitration. So, Aliona, I think you need to. Just from the international perspective, what we see in SIC arbitration, right? So, the practice, that's not going to be, <laughs> the practice of the tribunal seems to be to have a so it varies. We do see tribunals imposing uh, page limits, but most often that happens in cases where you can already sense that we do have a problematic case. So that's when the tribunal steps in, puts their foot down and says it will be not more than 65 pages, for instance. On on the other hand, quite often the tribunal imposes no such limits, but quite often also you don't need to impose because you see that the arbitration is going quite smoothly. So it varies on a case-by-case -case basis in our institution. Now, briefly again, in, in a couple of minutes, um, one point is basically dispensing with a hearing on the merits. Now, most institutional rules and many arbitration laws that I'm familiar with would tell you the tribunal has the upper hand into whether to hold a hearing on the merits or not. Now, if the arbitrators are faced with the situation, now we know that in the procedural audit will be accounted for and everything, but if the parties could not agree, are arbitrators inclined to start from the presumption that a hearing on the merits would take place, or not necessarily so? Krista? Well, most rules, or the ones I'm acquainted with, they say that uh, if... Um, one of the parties want a hearing, or, or if the tribunal wants a hearing, then there is a hearing. And parties, uh, for some reason, invariably want hearings. That's sort of part of the, uh, of the um, spectacle, so to say. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I must say, uh, in many cases, uh, witness uh, examinations are not really uh, carrying the day. It, it's really the paper trail that you are to deal with uh, that uh, will be decided. So you can have, um, uh, have decide cases without hearings, and it happens in smaller cases occasionally. Even if the parties do not agree? I mean, if it's by the agreement of the parties, that's fine. Well, usually it, it can be a respondent party who is silent, or so in that case it's... Uh, okay. Eva, what do you think? Um, again, it depends on the legal seat, number one, mm -hmm. first thing to check, Good and point. in the institutional rules. Perfect. Um, okay, uh, June, Vasily, do you wish, I mean, as counsel, as reasonable counsel, would you ever object to holding a hearing? It, it's hard to imagine such a situation. Okay, yeah. good. I, I agree. Okay, you've got a very good case on the documents. Everything is well said. You don't want to go to a hearing to avoid surprises. It's a possibility, but anyway. Well, in a recent case, in fact, um, it did happen. The claimant did not want the hearing, and one yeah. of the respondents did. Okay, good point. Now, what about... Uh, we all talk about due process from the perspective of the parties and counsel. Can you imagine a situation where an arbitrator would raise due process ex officio from the arbitrator's perspective? Not for one of the parties. That the arbitrator requires something in fulfillment of due process. You'll be, sur right, surprising? Yeah? Uh, well, it wouldn't happen on the, often, let's put it this way, but sometimes you do see arbitrators actually trying to put certain rules in place to ensure that at the end of the process, uh, everything is in order. So you would see interactive arbitrators stepping in. 
Yeah. Let me share with you a, a story that's happening as we speak. It's just three days ago, I'm sitting on a case where the parties have agreed with the tribunal unanimously that for the hearing, we will settle for an audio recording in the seat. We don't need written transcript. Everyone is happy, everyone goes home. The tribunal is deliberating, in my case. One of the arbitrators, for whatever reason, is unhappy with uh, um, the discussions. And so he said, I want a written transcript of the hearing. And we told him, well, the parties agreed no, and we have the audio recording. You can cite that. We have the minutes. And he said, no, 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 no. I work with paper. I'm not going to take this. Uh, the presiding arbitrator, I'm a wing in that case, the presiding arbitrator said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to impose that on the parties where we have closed the proceedings, and the parties have agreed. They submitted their cost submissions. This is extra cost. What should we do? The arbitrator went rogue and wrote to the parties on his own. It's a, you see, this, these are very interesting stories. And said to the parties, um, I want a written transcript silence from the parties because that's a co-arbitrator writing, not the presiding arbitrator. And the presiding arbitrator was unhappy and so he wrote to the parties saying, well the parties have agreed that there is no written transcript. It is Mr. X who wants the written transcript. It is not the tribunal's position, but if the parties are willing to provide that said. So the parties disagreed because one party was not paying on the costs and said um, the tribunal has to tell us how they wish us to proceed. We have submitted this, this is extra time. And then the arbitrator wrote back, he said, out of due process, for me to be able to deliberate properly, I need written transcript. I will not function with an audio, even though it was agreed initially. And so um, the parties need to address that. So that is a very awkward position. Now, I don't have the answer, but the parties will have to respond to this. But it's, it's an interesting point. And he said, as an arbitrator to be able to participate in the deliberations properly, I need to have this transcript of the hearing in writing, not audio. But if that was so, he, would, uh, he should have objected already when the parties agreed on it. Exactly, exactly. But, that, that's, that's, but I mean, we have it now. And, you know, one party said, you know, we're not going to provide that. And he said, you know, cost is not a barrier and whatever. But it's, it's an interesting point. Yeah, so logical. A logical continuation of this position would be that to properly operate, he would need written trans transcript of the deliberations themselves, because They're otherwise an yeah. arbitrator <laughs> can say no, no. A and then B and so yeah, on. Yeah. No, no, it's interesting. Yeah. Another situation which uh, crops up now and then is the ex parte. There you, uh, of course, have really to observe due process, and not only observe due process, you have to secure um, evidence you have to keep all these uh, tracking records of the career services that show that you sent every piece of paper because sometimes the uh, uh, respondent party is present in the beginning and then disappears yeah. into thin air or vice versa so yeah. uh, that is a very important to, to have all this documentation um, yes no it's interesting and, and and final point on that before we move to the final part can technology trigger due process objections, the use of technology. You've got on one side a very technology-oriented, technology-able, great resources, and you've got whatever, 10, 20 people representing one side, and you've got a solo person sitting there on his own with his own local resources, no technology. Can that trigger a sort of a disequilibrium in the way the proceedings are conducted and create due process issues? And if so, can the tribunal raise this on uh, in and of themselves, or if that poor guy raises this, how should the tribunal deal with that? Well, in very extreme cases, if one party doesn't have a computer and cannot read the transcripts at night after they are, are prepared, of course you have to raise it and, and try to solve it, but you that's raise a theoretical, it, yes. You, you raise it on your own? Uh, yeah, as, as, a, an as an arbitrator, yes. Okay. And it doesn't, it doesn't ever happen yeah. because this kind of divide between the uh, technological acumen between parties is rare or no, non-existent. 
I'm not sure it's non-existent. I mean, for certain parts of the world, it happens quite frequently. And in fact, if the arbitrator was to intervene, the technology-able party would say, so you are aiding a party that was not able to put resources to support his case. Mm -hmm. He feels sympathetic towards that party. That's, that's uh, yeah. I, I think generally we can agree that technology can save time and costs. I think technology is also referred to uh, ICC, what is it, Appendix 4, I think, when they list all these different techniques on saving time and costs. And as we all know, one of the main reasons why arbitration is being attacked is because it takes too long and it's too expensive. So on the one hand, technology should be embraced. And quite frankly, I don't know, what, let's say, 20 years from now, the robots will be doing our jobs anyway. And if we look at the developments in artificial intelligence, they're really quite astounding. So I think we have to embrace technology. On the other hand, I mean, again, very recently, I had a five-page letter objecting to Skype testimony, explaining all of the reasons why the party's right to examine, cross-examine the witness will be, uh, will suffer from, you know, these witnesses being examined by Skype. And that was a comparatively small case where really Skype testimony might have made sense. Perhaps robots could be part of the pledge in your course, <laughs> maybe, and uh, diversity. James, you wanted to add something? I wanted to, yeah, I wanted, I think, where, how does it actually come up in practice the way I see it is um, what um, Eva just mentioned, i.e. video testimony. I think that's a big one. I think the scope of document production requests, because of, you know, because everything is electronic, the scope has expanded tremendously in the effort of searching. The way you search, the search term discussion or the algorithm discussion, um, and then of course um, the the soft files, uh, because in document production, um, I think this comes up again and again that there's a discussion on you know must this be produced in the native files to actually um, interpret the authenticity and to interpret the substance of the of the document, um, including um, in documents that are that have interlinks that you cannot see on paper. So I think those are the way that the ways in which it, it manifests itself today, and those can uh, present due process concerns. Thank you. Now we move to the last part before we have open the floor for discussions. Now, the principal question, which is the reactions to due process. Now we've seen different scenarios where due process might arise in practice. Now, how should arbitral institutions and arbitral tribunal react to that? And my first point, institutions and tribunals, quickly, in, in one word, would you take cultural differences into account if you have a party from jurisdiction or a certain region? Would you take the cultural differences into account when looking into due process objections or use and abuse? Yes. I think institutions, um, you know, they, they, they are service providers. They provide frameworks um, and they provide the house within which the battle is fought. And so. Uh, I think institutions can smooth over a lot of problems, to be honest, by um, also respecting and accommodating cultural aspects. Um, and whether that's, um, as we had recently a case uh, from uh, involving a Latin American party and an Austrian party, and there, you know, it was very clear that um, there was one way to handle the situation that would lead to a consolidation of cases, and there was another way to handle the situation that would lead to two separate arbitrations with lots of costs, extra effort, and unhappiness on every one side. And um, I think the way to, the proper way to deal with these situations is to try to accommodate a little bit more to come up with a situation that saves everyone a lot of uh, pain, um, and that is. Another reason why I think institutions tend to be more accommodating to due process concerns than arbitral tribunals are and should, uh, because we cannot be reviewed. Um, we are there to help to accommodate. And uh, in the end, it usually pays off to be more accommodating at the early stage, um, whereas the tribunals, I think once the parties see where the train is heading, uh, the due process, the objections increase. And so does the need to be strong and courageous. And I think that is where, um, where the guts are missing sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you wanna, thank you. And perhaps you can then, in addition, consider whether accommodating has a different connotation from compromising or not. 
So I would second my colleague that in the current multi-jurisdictional environment, you have to be culturally sensitive. But then there's also a question of integrity of the process. So I think it's a balancing exercise. You do accommodate and you do take into account certain particular cultural requirements or cultural differences. But at the same time, you try to make sure that it's an even playing field that it's actually an integral process which is not jeopardized. And the question as to whether accommodating is compromising, well, some see compromise uh, to have a negative connotation, connotation, so I think we should just stay with accommodating. Thank you. And, and Krista, how should tribunals quickly Well, I, have, I don't have so much experience um, of that. I have uh, experience where there have been uh, different, uh, let's say, degrees of experience uh, on each side. And I think sometimes there one can allow oneself to be a little more articulate, uh, articulate in uh, procedural orders, uh, not only say statement of, um, uh, uh, statement of claim on the 3rd of November, but also say uh, the, the party should consider that in, in the submission include issues concerning claim, whether they, I mean, a little pedagogically uh, include text uh, which uh, would be unnecessary uh, with experienced counsel. And so I think that's accommodation, I think, very much so. So one uh, party may take some benefit from that text, the other one not, but, but that levels out the playing field. Well, I have little to add. I think you need to be mindful, certainly, not necessarily accommodating. Well, I suppose it depends. Um, I certainly have uh, seen in a couple of cases where the cultural differences are quite big, and the parties also make a point of that, that in our country we do it this way, and it starts right from the start about the timetable, for example, even basic things like that the witness statements and expert reports would come uh, much later in the proceedings, although that's not what we're used to in international arbitration. So I think as an, as an arbitrator, that's really your job to explain. And if there are some true reasons why it is difficult for a party to abide by, let's say, the general procedure, then you need to be mindful of that and possibly accommodating. But it is also your job right from the start, if you're faced with these different cultural differences, um, to explain the procedure. In, so, a, in a not, you know, in a condescending way, but, you know, in a friendly way. I'm asking this question because being mindful definitely is, is a proper word and accommodating is another proper word. I'm saying that because some arbitrators feel that international arbitration has spawned its own culture. So, in effect, it's a third culture. So, when you come to the game and under the table, you're not going to drag with you your local practices, in a way, and package this as a culture and impose it on the other side, because the other side might do the same, and then the arbitrators who might have different backgrounds have different perceptions, um, and, and so it becomes a little bit messy. And so, in, from counsel's perspective, do you think tribunals should be mindful, accommodating, or accepting cultural differences? Do you? Um, most of most of the cases that I've been on, basically, uh, there's basically quality of arms. Where you're usually up against other international law firms. So even though let's say the clients may be from different uh, jurisdictions, usually the counsel are quite familiar with each other. So I haven't really had that experience. Vasily, okay. I think the tribunal needs to make sure that it treats every party equally and fairly, and that it understands each party's case. And well, how to achieve that, I think, I think Eva said that in some situations, states should need more time to respond and so on. So I think it's all just details. So you need to understand the case, not necessarily the culture. You need to understand the case, but since the party presenting this case has certain culture, you may need to take that into account. Okay. Now, that, that's interesting, and I, I would invite our audience to share their views, but do you think it's beneficial, everyone, if the arbitrators come across as being culturally sensitive and aware, does that bring into the proceedings a level of confidence and trust in the arbitrators that will eventually lead to an aversion of disputes on minor issues? I, I'm saying that because psychologically, when you have a party who feels that the arbitrators 
ignore or do not understand the culture and are not open to understanding that, he will start picking on every and single issue. And, and that might not be for the integrity and efficiency of proceedings productive. Uh, I recall I was at one of the gatherings in London several years ago, and two very prominent practitioners, arbitration practitioners, they spoke at, at that event. And the, the task was to argue whether London or Paris should be the real center of international arbitration. And so it's, it's interesting because an English, an English lawyer, he, he said that, well, London is a financial center, uh, English is used throughout the world now, English law is very well respected, so of course England should be the center for international arbitration. And the Paris guy, he said that if this is the position, then it would be very easy for, for Paris to, to be the first because international arbitration is not about English, it's not about English law, it's not about London as financial center, it's around, it's, it, it's about uh, the world and the world in all its diversity, cultural and language-wise. So I think what you are saying is just two approaches which were reflected at that, at that discussion. Yes. Now, I ask each and every one of you to say in one word, yes or no. Should due process allegations or objections be assessed differently in traditional versus fast track arbitrations? James. No. <laughs> no. Okay. You see, the Germans are very strict. Uh, I go with no. Okay. Okay. No. No. <laughs> what do you think? It depends on which side you are. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> the council will start playing the game. Maybe. Well, Depends. Council. See, cou you will never get an answer from council because they realize they will represent parties depending on where they stand. Okay. Now, then we move. No, but I have to add okay. to this because sure. I think this is very important. The expedited rules, ICC, and the fact that among other things, uh, I don't know to what extent you're aware, but basically it's about like, small claims um, below two million and the expedited process. I mean, there could be some due process allegations inherent in the actual expedited rules, so we can't say no because not only um, they give away of terms of reference, which okay, that's fine, but they actually give the right to the court to appoint one arbitrator. one arbitrator in contradiction to a party's agreement to three arbitrators. So that's potentially a due which process in, violation right there. Which in some jurisdictions might not fly and, and, and does not sit well with Vasily's point about the prime directive that a party chooses his arbitrator, which by the way is coming under attack in international arbitration under the pretext of impartiality and independence and ethics generally. Um, so then how should arbitral tribunals penalize the abuse of due process? Would you do that during the proceedings or in your award? Well, you should not um, uh, dedicate any uh, part of the award to uh, castigate uh, party council. Uh, that's the wrong forum. I think uh, if you um, make some innuendos uh, during the course of the hearing, uh, party council will be quite heedful to that uh, and it often sorts itself out. We have the magic powerful tool of costs. So you would do it in the award? And I think the parties, uh, increasingly, in comparison to 10 years ago, I see the parties are increasingly aware of the value of costs. Because before, yeah. you know, we'd have prayers for relief saying, and we request costs. Now we have cost submissions explaining the legal principles, what the other party did wrong, you know, the witnesses, the jurisdictional objections, very detailed reasons why costs should go this or the other way. And that's obviously very helpful for the tribunal, not only as a reminder, but it also gives us the the um, opportunity to, to potentially penalize a party for being abusive. I'm saying that because I'm chairing a tribunal now. You've got one party who's European, the other uh, from a different jurisdiction outside Europe, another continent. And the tribunal, I mean, they've put in experts and we want a joint statement by experts, areas agreed and disagreed. And counsel for one of the parties is completely objecting to that. He said, our experts will not concede to any agreed point by the experts. And then we had two conference calls with issued procedural orders saying that experts have an overriding duty to assist the tribunal and cooperate and collaborate. And then the party said, you know, we don't do that in our jurisdiction, with which I'm very familiar, but, he, you know, counsel, it comes from a litigation background. And then we rendered the procedural order unanimously, the tribunal, and one party said, you know, still, we're not going to ask our experts to have this joint statement. So then the European 
party with, with the council wrote back to the tribunal and said, we want an order now from the tribunal saying whether they're, they're going to change their order or whether the other party is acting abusively. And if so, we want an immediate sanction. So the question is, as you mentioned, Eva, you've got the magical point about costs. But by the way, I have to tell you, some arbitrators say, would you penalize a party by allocating costs to that party for the acts done by counsel? In fact, I've had it in one case saying, one party said and challenged the award, it, it, not in my case, but in another case, he said, counsel had a power of attorney to represent me in the arbitration. Whatever act of misbehavior and misconduct from counsel is a tort that is not caught by the power of attorney. How can we be penalized by bearing those costs for acts that do not fall under the power of attorney and are not within the jurisdiction of the tribunal? Very interesting, constructive, engineered allegation. Now, the court disregarded that, by the way. The, the arbitral award stood, but uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I think there's another very interesting aspect on that. Christian will probably correct or um, add to what I have to say, but I, I think in Sweden there's this recent practice where if you're challenging an arbitral award and you really have no grounds for it in the view of the court, then the court may actually penalize the counsel for the challenge. At least that's what I've been told. There have been, I think, uh, two cases and they have created an uproar, but if you look at them, uh, it's no big deal. They are very exceptional where there was absolutely no uh, remote uh, ground to uh, challenge and where uh, it was a very abusive process and still council was just asked to pay a rather small fraction of the overall costs. So uh, I, I don't think I should be, you should not be afraid at any rate. <laughs> no, no, so but I think it's, it's, it's interesting so, to note. And I was also told that that actually comes from, um, I, I don't know, again, I'm just uh, repeating, um, from the Russian parties, in fact, <laughs> that's the explanation that I heard, that sometimes in some of the Russian cases, the clients really insist on challenging the award simply as a matter of principle, um, and that's where it yeah, came I, from. I can I'll tell you something. For example, in the MENA region and some African states, it is a standard procedure that you will challenge the award no matter what. It is standard. And no one should take it personal. It's just the facts. Maybe you need to, you know, to survive the enforcement stage. But um, I, I wanted to, looking for a pretext, and I think I found, I found it. <laughs> we have introduced a provision that says the tribunal can sanction um, obstructionist conduct in the cost decision, something that some people in the process said was obvious, inherent in the procedural powers. Others said, no, it's not. And so we spelled it out in our rules, and we hope it will be used. We also are able to we also introduced a provision which I think is quite relevant to this discussion because the due process paranoia was um, was something that was in the back of our minds um, as it is I think in the back of our, every institution's minds in the last five years and we looked at um, the case management conference, we introduced a mandatory agenda and one of the things that's on the agenda that you have to discuss at the beginning are certain measures like limiting the amount of submissions, limiting the length of submissions, lim limiting the number of witness statements, limiting or excluding document production. All these things are in an agenda and if the parties don't agree in them, the tribunal can unilaterally impose them. Something that again, most people said the tribunal can do anyway, despite the due process paranoia, but that tribunals haven't done and so we wanted to give them the some courage, so to speak putting this into, into the rules. That's useful. Let me take you on this and then Aliona's uh, point. And briefly, again, a yes or no question which people don't like, but the question is, now, should arbitral institutions, are, are you pro giving tribunals the power to dismiss frivolous or abusive claims or arguments in a summary fashion? Yes or no? I'm sorry, it's, it's a maybe. I, we decided against doing this. Sweden did it and Singapore did it. Uh, we felt it was a mini arbitration within an arbitration, so it would defeat the purpose 
Um, and the summary judgment, at least, you know, I'm a U.S. trained lawyer, comes from a system that's very different. It works in that system. It probably doesn't work as well in arbitration without creating extra round of uh, submissions on whether something is ripe for summary or not. I'm very glad that we will have different views of that. <laughs> you only have got to defend this. Absolutely. So as already said, SIC has introduced the early dismissal procedure of claims and defenses. So just to look over it, you can apply for early dismissal in, in case your claim or defense is managed manifestly without legal merit or manifestly outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So that's the version in the commercial rules. And when one looks at the structure, I do understand uh, your concerns or the viewpoint which was presented by my colleague, but when one looks at the structure of the rules, the threshold for uh, early dismissal is quite high. We're talking manifestly. So it's already something that you would have a frivolous claim or you would have a frivolous defense and being able or enabling the tribunal to actually dismiss it and not waste costs and not waste time can be seen as something, you know, fighting the due process paranoia in a way. Now, of course, the ICC done it in a different way, included it to the note to the parties and arbitral tribunals saying that the rules, nothing prevents that. So it's the note. Now, from the arbitrator's perspective, would a provision to that effect in the rules or in the explanation note, help in a way by, with this high threshold, giving you the authority, the empowerment, or you, do you think 1,000 times before you exercise that? Um, instincti instinctively, I, I uh, feel a little queasy about uh, this thing. It goes against the grain of the adjudication of whatever uh, wild claim uh, comes before you, but I cannot find any very good and uh, stringent uh, explanation. Now, Eva, you will say maybe, but I caution you when you say maybe, which are you inclined more to say that it's difficult to put it into effect or say that there are flagrant possibilities where you would put it into effect? I would say that it is not necessary. I think there are other ways. Okay. of um, getting rid of frivolous claims okay. as opposed to just dismissing them outright. But definitely a provision in the rules would help, but I would also draw attention to the legal seat. That's also Thank important. Thank you. Now, counsel, are you pro or against early dismissal? Uh, in theory, uh, I, I don't see any harm in it. I mean, I'd like to actually try it. Do you, yeah, so do you see a benefit in it? Yeah, I see the benefit. Okay. Vasily? Honestly, I'm somewhat against it. You're against it? Yes, I would, okay. I would think that we've got several legal systems, US legal system, English legal system, German legal system, and if parties chose arbitration, then it, it, it can be something separate. So we've got a divided panel on that, so now it falls squarely on your shoulders to say your views on this. And then my last point before we hand it over is basically the paranoia element in due process. To what extent do judicial decisions, and we've got six countries, three continents, uh, on setting aside or enforcement actually justify this paranoia that we have? They do not justify it at all. If you look at the case decisions, and it's uniform, Singapore, US, Switzerland, Germany, I know more about Switzerland and Germany, you can do almost anything without being overturned. The cases that overturn arbitral awards on due process violations are extreme obvious cases where none, nobody in this room, I think, would, would argue with the fact that the tribunal violated fundamental norms, um, uh, such as, you know, clearly giving one party an opportunity to say something and not the other, such as um, violating agreed, agreed procedural uh, terms, um, or disregarding fundamental arguments or surprising the parties with fundamental new arguments. But they are very much on the outer edge of the spectrum. So the judicial decisions that I'm familiar with give broad latitude to reasonable um, exercise of, of, of courage. And, and, and so I think the paranoia is, to a large extent, um, the paranoia. There's another thing that Mr. Söderlund mentioned, and I think that's important, and that is that while the paranoia is not justified and while um, you will not be overturned in 99% of decisions, it might be nevertheless reasonable to be a little bit here and there uh, accommodating to lend um, a buy-in and a support from the parties to the process and to 
um, make the losing party feel that they were heard, which is also how you write the award to make sure that the loser understands how you get to your decision. So I think um, the paranoia is not justified, but sensitivity is justified. So you probably shouldn't use the 99% of the power that you have, but maybe only 90%. So you mentioned that before we go to Aliona's point, uh, view on this, you mentioned that pretty much most jurisdictions would agree you can do whatever you want, which by the way had a backlash now with witnessing against arbitration. But let me give you a clear scenario, and it's, it's a real case. What happens if the tribunal tells the parties we're going to have a tribunal appointed expert? The tribunal meets with the expert. The expert renders a report. The, tribunals rely, the tribunal relies on the report. The parties see it in the award. It, does that raise an that, issue? It will be yes. Decided? Yeah, well, that, that sounds to me like an extreme case. Right? English courts said no. That's in a case called the Amin case. Said, you know, it's, we disagree with what the tribunal has done, but it's okay. So you see, even with developed jurisdictions, we might have different views on that. Uh, so I some agree with you, by the way. In our <laughs> jurisdictions, it will be set aside outright. So some people actually like to call it uh, the curse of the New York Convention. So we have certain procedural uh, rules to abide and we have to ensure that at the end of the day we do have an enforceable award. And sometimes when one looks at, uh, well depending on the seat of course, but when one looks at the general framework of the New York Convention set aside and the refusal of enforcement grounds, people sometimes take it too far. So just to explain, the way let's say SIC does scrutiny of awards, so the way we look at it you can scrutinize an award and you can see problems with the award which actually have nothing to do with the enforcement, which would be uh, not a very profi you know, proficient exercise. So I think the question is actually, as my colleague pointed out, focusing on what can make your award unenforceable under the new convention and not taking those grounds too far. So I think that would help us to find the paranoia. Thank you. I agree 100% uh, and uh, we are really talking tonight about paranoia, that is a fear which is not uh, grounded in any uh, factual uh, uh, base work. Thank you. Vasily? If you have a case and you are to enforce an award in a certain jurisdiction and then you see an argument made by the other side and you understand that the thrust of this argument is not to fight it in the arbitration but to find it in the local courts at the enforcement stage. I think that counsel uh, can become quite paranoid about how to make sure that things are done right. And I would say that counsel are becoming more paranoid here than the tribunal. Yeah. I'm just saying that because sometimes a party or council might abuse due process in a way knowing that courts are not well versed in international arbitration in a certain jurisdiction which justifies this paranoia in a way but courts who have determined in an outright way situations where yes this is acceptable no this is not acceptable that I think council would think several times before they invoke an argument. Eva? Yeah. Um, again, I agree with the other panelists, and in particular is what James said as well. I would only add um, about the English jurisdiction. I looked up some recent statistics. Apparently, in the last three years, there have been 112 challenges on the grounds of serious irregularity under the English Arbitration Act, and only one has succeeded. And there is a very interesting judgment, by the way, also perhaps relevant to this part of the world, of last week by the English High Court in a case of SCM uh, versus Raga where um, the award was challenged on the basis that the tribunal did not wait for the Ukrainian court to deliver a decision, which may have impacted the outcome of the arbitration. And the judge said that even if that were so, nonetheless, no. that's no yeah. serious irregularity. So that's, um, it was a big case as well, a billion dollar case. Thank you. June? I, I basically agree with everyone. Um, I think it's overblown. Okay, thank you. Now we turn it over to you if you have any questions. I have to s sincerely thank my um, esteemed colleagues and panelists for their insightful contributions. And we now open it for the floor if you have any questions, comments, sharing your perspective. Yes, please. Perhaps it's helpful to identify yourself as well. Uh, sure, I'm Dimitri Andreev uh, from the Russian law firm MZS. 
we are mostly child lawyers and not arbitration lawyers, but we come across due process, uh, not much of like an paranoia, but we see in this uh, an opportunity, whether we act for the winning party or the, or the losing party there. Um, one thing that comes up very often in the, in the Russian uh, trial, uh, whether it's enforcement stage or set aside, is uh, what we call surprise decision, and uh, that's what James and Mohammed, I think, mentioned cursely uh, during the talk. Uh, I, would, I would like to know your views on, the, on that uh, in terms of what, what would you do if you, you suddenly think that there's a way to resolve this dispute that neither party has really discussed. Because in Russia, th there's the different views on that, but... You were a Novit huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, our clients, the, the end users of arbitration, often see those phrases in the New York Convention on the Model Law th that they were unable to otherwise present the case uh, as a, a ground for them to have every view of the tribunal, preliminary view, uh, heard in the, in, or at least seen in, the, in any written form before it comes to an award so that they can comment on that. So the tribunal, that's, that's another topic. I think it requires a full day, but briefly so, and we will have different views, I'm sure, on this. Should tribunals consider arguments or um, claims or something not raised by the party in the interests of justice and efficiency? I guess you're exempted from this as, as arbitrary institutions, unless you want to share some views. I have another rule I can talk about. <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> The, I mean, the German and Swiss judgments are pretty clear. You, 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 there's no surprise on the factual side. In other words, you cannot, you're not entitled to know what the tribunal is thinking about the facts and which way it's, on which fact it's going to rely. But there is surprise uh, on the legal side if it's um, not pleaded and not reasonably foreseeable. In other words, if a certain contractual provision, re you know, uh, brings about a certain legal provision in the code, in the applicable code, then you're not, you can't be surprised usually just because you didn't argue it. But um, again, handle with care. I would say to the tribunals, uh, even you shouldn't uh, use up all the scope that the, that the jurisprudence gives you. And now, from the institutional point of view, we introduced, and I think this is uh, quite topical, we introduced something that allows the tribunal to give preliminary views, which is also a cultural thing, something that the German-speaking countries do based on their judicial provisions where the tribunal meets after the first round of briefs and tells the parties, this argument is strong, this one is weak, here you need more, here, here you need less. We're thinking in this direction right now, this is all preliminary and don't challenge us on it, and there's usually something in the terms of the reference. And I think that helps prevent the surprise, because you know very early on which way um, which way they're thinking. Some common lawyers don't like it because it's uh, contrary to their nature, but it's, it's quite effective. And if done well, I think the common lawyers um, will like it. Well, would you say that an argument, not on the facts, but a certain debt that is not subject to a disagreement between the parties regarding its characterization uh, is time barred, and the time bar is very clear? Would the tribunal raise that with the parties? Chris, you want to yeah, And this doesn't happen, but, uh, but uh, the tribunal should not raise that uh, because that would be a novel issue. And as for these preliminary sort of um, uh, views, I, I think that also it's not, uh, I, I don't think the tribunal should do anything but give the definite word. To, to give some uh, inklings uh, in a very premature stage when you don't have all the arguments in and you didn't understand the case yet, or perhaps will never understand the case. I think that is a little dangerous. Thank you. Vasily? It's, it's my personal view expressed in the complete vacuum, if I may put so. I think, I, I, think, I think surprises may depend on whether they are on evidence, on factual matters, or on claims and conclusions. Because if we take assessment of evidence, I would say the tribunal should have uh, a lot of liberty here. And if one person or one party says that, well, this document should be interpreted in this way, and the other side says, well, no, this way, I, I, I think it's, it's quite possible that a prudent tribunal says, no, it's the third way, because we disagree with both of you. Uh, if we are going the legal area, well, like, well, claim, uh, ground of claim, 
I think I think I think the approach should be more careful here because because a defendant is responding to the claim as it is put by the by, by the claimant. So if the tribunal has a lot of liberty here, then this could be prejudicial to the claimant uh, uh, to to the to the respondent itself. And as regards voluntarily raising certain issues, well, uh, or certain arguments, I think I think as a rule. Uh, the tribunal should be careful about doing that, but if the tribunal has a question why both parties are silent on this limitation period issue, is there something behind that? Is it, well, is it a real arbitration or not? Is it a game or not? Why are they afraid of that? Maybe there is some fact behind that which they are hiding from me. Well, maybe the tribunal should somehow raise this point. Thank you. Eva? Well, I tend to think that parties are really the masters of the arbitration process mm -hmm. generally and perhaps that is a difference that I see between arbitrators and judges generally. So mm -hmm. I would not raise issues on my own too much because you just don't know what's going on. There might, there might be settlement discussions, there, there might be all sorts of different reasons. Now, of course there are exceptions and one issue that I've also seen tribunals really struggle with is um, doubt and fears about corruption issues. Illegality and stuff. And illegality. Yeah. And that, that's justifiable, digging into that point. But I think going beyond, you're going into really making a quantum leap into the darkness, which tribunals should steer away from, in a way. Because you, it's not only about surprises. Because you can, some people say that surprises, you just put it to the parties and let them decide how they wish to prosecute it. The problem is when you do that, you're actually helping one party at the expense of the other. You're drawing their attention to a point which I think goes beyond the role of the arbitral tribunal. Yes, I agree. And in any, in any case, um, I think parties should always be given a chance to comment. Um, yeah. You're an Ovid Kuria or not, there's simply no reason not to. Okay. Just raise it at any time. If, I mean, yeah. it almost goes without saying. Instead of relying upon it in the award, you know, you, you must raise it with yeah. the parties, full stop. June? No, so uh, I've, I've seen two cases where actually the uh, courts have set aside uh, awards precisely on that basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That the tribunal crossed the line? Yes. Okay. Now, of course, drawing the line is not easy. But anyway, so any other questions, comments? Yeah, Sini? My name is Ksenia and I work in the Russian Arbitration Center. First of all, thank you very much because most of the paranoias I have were addressed. But probably there is one more issue that i am become very paranoid about, is the situations when one party is absent, when it refuses to participate in the proceedings, or for example in some small cases, sometimes you even cannot contact one of the parties. So probably could you give a brief overview of how institutions, arbitrators, and most interestingly, interestingly councils um, ensure the, that the due process is respected when That's one party is absent? It's an excellent question, Ksenia, and I have to say, and then the, I leave it on to them. It's quite striking how people differ on that, and it goes beyond the civil common law divide, because I have seen common law arbitrators assuming the role of what counsel for the other party would have done, including when it comes to document production. The arbitrators would request a party to produce documents and, in fact, test their case based on their you know, knowledge as arbitrators and everything. So, in fact, I have seen situations where it would have been excellent for the party not to appear because they would have excellent arbitrators defending them rather than paying a penny to counsel who might not do good as a job. <laughs> That's really funny. It's true, actually. You can lose against an absent respondent. That's really embarrassing for counsel. <laughs> but um, the, there are three things institutions have to think about. The formalities. So we always send everything by courier, even though we've gone electronic. But you know, if, with an absent parties, we, we, have, we keep all the receipts in the original and we uh, provide that to the tribunal and to the winning party upon request. 
for enforcement purposes. Um, second, the appointment of the uh, arbitrator on behalf of the absent party. Here, as an institution, you want to put yourself into those shoes. You really want to make sure you choose a good, strong candidate, someone who can stand up to the other person, um, the other wingman uh, or woman, and someone who ideally is from the country uh, of the absent respondent. We usually have the problem of foreign absent respondents. The, 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 um, it may be a function of the particular commercial relationships where DIS clauses are chosen that the German claimant um, participates and the foreign respondent does not. So we have a stronger share of non-participating foreigners. And there we have tried to make sure to appoint a person from that country as the arbitrator to enhance um, the legitimacy also of the process, which I think is important. And then finally, at the time of um, uh, the tribunal itself should be mindful, and we sometimes provide informal advice, in other words, telling the tribunal, reminding them to cross all the T's, um, providing them advice on what has worked in the past uh, in terms of uh, and in terms of uh, ensuring delivery of documents uh, and, and things like that we um, um, that's also true when the claimant asks uh, and we usually try to follow the claimant's requests in terms of the service of process um, and we've done different things we've used bailiffs we've used uh, we've actually inquired with a helicopter service where there was a respondent in the Ukraine that was not reachable by by <laughs> road traffic, so um, we have interesting war stories on that, in that respect. Uh, well, definitely in case of a non-participating respondent, there would be extra steps taken by an institution to ensure that each and every uh, possibility was taken to inform the resp uh, non-participating -res non respondent, because sometimes non-participating respondent is actually just one hiding from the proceedings. So, you know, and you do have uh, addresses to courier to, you do have email um, which you can send letters to, so we do make those extra steps. Another thing which is important to understand that in major procedural rules, the tribunal does have the right to continue with the proceedings in the absence of the respondent, right? And it's very important because otherwise we would jeopardize the efficiency of the process. So I think it's always balanced. You try to inform the non-participating respondent, but you also want to move ahead with the case. And last but not least, as an institution, when we do scrutinize the awards, what we try um, to ensure that each and every step contacting the respondent is actually recorded in the award. Because you'd be surprised, but there are certain jurisdictions which need that spelled out. Otherwise, you will not have an enforceable award. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, it is, uh, as, as you say, so in the procedural history there will be this and that was sent by DHL on such and such and the tracking number such and such received, etc., etc for whatever worth it may have. Uh, then, of course, when it comes to the uh, merits of such a case, usually uh, you, you, you make a um, overview of the case and many times, or always, as far as I am know, uh, the um, claimant has uh, prevailed. But, of course, uh, the, uh, theoretically, it could be the other way. So sometimes respondent plays even smarter Well, it's a very interesting question. In fact, I've had <laughs> all sorts of cases like these, both the small ones that you mentioned, the ones where the respondent doesn't appear and then after six months suddenly appears, finally, great. And also, in fact, let's not forget that in investment arbitration context, that's a very pertinent issue. And as probably many of you will know also in this country, there are some very significant investment arbitrations where um, the state is not participating. And um, notification is extremely important, that's one. I did want to make the paranoia point, though, about the timetable, because, of course, as an arbitrator, you always must ensure that the party is notified, that it's given enough time. But one smart thing to do, not to wait those three or four months or whatever for the statement of defense, is to have an accelerated timetable. 
So what you can do, not to waste time, is to say, you know, unless we hear from the respondent within, let's say, three weeks or something more reasonable, we'll proceed under this timetable. So again, I'm talking more about the big cases that justify something like that. You do not really need to wait for the four months to expire for the non-participating respondent not to respond. So there is the option of providing the accelerated timetable as well. Uh, as counsel, I don't like when the other side is not appearing for two basic reasons. The first reason, and it, it, it can be unfair to the, uh, to the arbitrators, but I don't think that it's a must that you will win the case, because I think that a reasonable tribunal will try to ensure that it is making justice to the non-appearing party and will be attentive to its potential arguments. Well, that's how I see uh, this situation as counsel. Uh, and on the second, uh, on the se uh, on on on, um, on the second uh, front, uh, you may have tremendous difficulties when you enforce the award in a local jurisdiction. So, typically, we will try to make sure that the uh, that the adversary does appear. So you will call them. Uh, you will sometimes agree to extend the time for arbitrate uh, for selection of arbitrate for of arbitrator, so that they have an additional incentive to pop up nominate a tribunal and and then and then they are in the proceedings so that's that's how we'll do it before june uh, shares his views i'll ask you a difficult question is there a situation that you would ever advise your client not to appear in an arbitration <laughs> it's it's not excluded <laughs> I did want to add one very quick but important point when it comes to the tribunal actually becoming active and as you mentioned, uh, doing the job for the non-appearing uh, council. Yeah. Actually, when it comes to jurisdiction, in most jurisdictions, the tribunal does have the duty to establish the jurisdiction so aponte. So that's important. That's different for the merits, but when it comes to jurisdiction, certainly the tribunal is not only bound by the arguments of no, one of party. jurisdiction, but they go into the merits a lot as well. Say, well, what if that defense is brought? You've got to. So some have done that. Even it's like a mock arbitration. Uh, yes. Sure. I've never actually been in that situation. Whether you know, I'm advising the my clients to not participate. Uh, that I I would probably never do that. Uh, I wouldn't either. I mean, uh, uh, yes. Uh, just for this, the, the reason that I think even if we do contest jurisdiction, for instance, we would want to be able to have control over uh, some part of the process. Uh, and then if we're on the other side and we're the ones uh, bringing the claim, I think uh, you know, the, the, the respondents that we've had, I think they are also of the similar mindset uh, because there's maybe just too much at stake. Mohammed Hizam from Hawk International. My question is the tribunal already fixed the time for the final award. And then also the time for the ICC to approve it. And then suddenly after one month they came back and tell, say that, okay, due to the difficulty of the issues, we would like one month or two months more. What can I do in this case? to say no. Okay. So that's number one. And yeah. I have another question yeah. that briefly, that the enforcement of the cases. Suppose I got a case against one body of road of authority in Africa, in Ethiopia, for example, and I couldn't enforce this. What shall I do? What is the ways I can get the verdict of the tribunal Enforce. Thank you. So for your two questions, let me help you. I think the first one is addressed to arbitral institutions, and the second one is addressed to counsel, unless arbitrators want to share their view. So on the first question, when you have, assuming there is a scrutiny, just a minute, so with the scrutiny and the extension and the court sets or the institution sets the time limit, and one party is dissatisfied and expressed that, what should the institutions do? Uh, so firstly, under our rules, we have a timeline for the tribunal to submit the draft award to us for review. Because different institutions handle timelines differently, right? So 
Requests for extensions do come from the tribunal, but when the registrar decides whether to grant or not to grant an extension, it's a very rigorous exercise. So actually a lot of factors are taking in, as well as the, the grounds for the request must actually be quite significant. So you can't just, you know, say, let's say, oh, I'm running late and I'm so sorry. It, it wouldn't work. But if, let's say, an arbitrator falls ill, and we had cases, an arbitrator broke his back, you know, so that's a reasonable ground for requesting an extension. So I think it's always an exercise for an institution to be very mindful of the timelines, but at the same time, understand the situation as it is and properly uh, uh, react to it. That's another opportunity. We don't have a full scrutiny, so with the DIS, you don't have to wait an extra six weeks before you get your award. <laughs> and we have a mini scrutiny, so we'll do a 48, 72-hour check for obvious problems in the operative part, formalities, missing seat, and things like that, which actually happens even from time to time. So we catch some obvious mistakes, but we don't interfere with the substance of the award. We have a new rule which was inspired by the ICC. It's a deadline for the award three months after the last hearing or the last submission on the merits. That's not the cost submissions. That's the post-hearing brief usually. It's sanctioned. We can reduce the fees. Now, the fees, the new rules are in effect since 1st of March, so we don't have an arbitral award yet. We have 25 new cases, but no award yet. And we will be strict, like Singapore. We will be strict. We, 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 you won't want to be the first one to test our <laughs> resolve. <laughs> and uh, my view, and I think the institution's view, is if you are too busy to meet this deadline and knowing what the case is about when you are proposed the mandate then you shouldn't take the mandate you should leave it to someone who can meet the deadline now there's the exceptional cases um, where the case becomes a lot more complicated midway through or where something unforeseeable happens at the end but otherwise uh, we will try to enforce it and we have the cost sanction attached to it we can reduce yeah. the fee to be, to be objective about this now when the icc introduced the sanctions most of the objectives were unhappy and many institutions said we will not follow suit. I said it's inevitable. For one reason, if you as an arbitrator, you're going to be sanctioned by an institution, yes. and another institution does not have the sanction, which award will you prioritize? Yeah, we have that problem. So now, most institutions are going to do that. Now, so it's, 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 it's quite interesting to see how this uh, plays off. But of course, another point, in, in being an arbitrator, but in all neutrality and objectivity, Arbitrators are very fast to accept appointments and nominations, saying they can take it on board. But when it comes through the case and they want increase in the fees or extra time, suddenly the complexity of the case manifests itself. Whereas when they accept it, it's a very simple case for them. <laughs> just to be controversial. Uh, can I just quickly comment that uh, in current global arbitration regime, everyone's interconnected. So arbitrators are connected to the institutions, institutions connected to council. So at the end of the day, from what I see in my position at SIC, everyone is interested to get the award out as fast as possible. So let's say SIC would scrutinize within two weeks. The tribunals take their duty to produce the award within the required time frame very seriously. So I think because all of us are so interconnected, at the end of the day, we strive to have it on time. <laughs> I'll just add from the ICC's perspective, they have in fact applied the sanctions as well. Of course. And yeah. even so, applied it even on the ICC secretariat if they are late with the scrutiny. So it's not only the arbitrators, because arbitrators have complained, if we submit on time, but the delay is not from us. So they said, well, the sanction applies to everyone. Mm. So. And just a quick tip for you as counsel, I think there's, well, two things you can do. First, you appoint efficient arbitrators. <laughs> Available arbitrators? Available arbitrators. And second, it doesn't hurt to write to the tribunal. I mean, it, it's funny that I'm saying that. <laughs> I mean, it's like a yeah. good, But it does add pressure if you do, you know, write an email saying, by the way, the deadline is approaching. Do you tend to abide? Uh, what's the timing? It's very important for the client for so and so reason. So, um. but you're very nice. Some arbitrators would be pissed off with such communication. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I didn't say I wasn't, <laughs> but I but I, I'm only saying it works. <laughs> yeah, but in whose favor? That's another. No. <laughs> um, any further questions? Ah, for counsel, the enforcement. Vasily, we've got to answer. How can he guarantee he's getting the money? Any special tricks? Free advice? 
<laughs> injunction. Security for security which you can get during the arbitration. Depending on the jurisdiction, you might be able to actually apply for uh, winding up proceedings. So I've seen that happen actually twice, where uh, we've actually applied for winding up proceedings on the basis that the uh, the other side are supposed to pay uh, the award, but they refuse to. Some jurisdictions will al will actually allow you to use the non-payment as a basis for basically winding up that company. Which in our, by the way, jurisdictions would be a bankruptcy. You commence bankruptcy proceedings based on the debt has been confirmed by an award, which is a good, useful trick. Thank you very much, June. Yeah. And it happens and prompts a party to pay, assuming court proceedings are fast, which is not. Um, any other questions, comments? Then I have to say... You add another question, but no free advice anymore. <laughs> no. Okay, now. The respondent make counter guarantee. And this counter guarantee exaggerated a lot. It's and a real case. It's yeah, a real case. Advice. Yeah, yeah, it's a real case. It's yeah. So they come with counter claim. Tribunal accept it. And it takes a long time with a lot of headache. So when the hearing come, in the date of the hearing, they drop out all these things. So they cost us a lot of headache, a lot of evidence, and they want a lot of things with that one, and suddenly, because they know that it's not, there is no basis for it, but the tribunal accept it. But on the date of the hearing, they drop all that. So, I mean, I have a case like this. They, they, claim, they claim 75 million against me, dollar. And then, on the hearing date, they drop it out. There is no hearing? You mean they no, they, they drop that case on the hearing. They said that we are, our claim is dropped. So, you so what shall I do here? You request here? costs, the costs that you have incurred. You would have prevailed, and you request costs. Only costs? Including your legal costs. You want compensation for moral harm? Moral harm, you're being sued, not in every jurisdiction. Some people see moral harm is not, uh, you need to substantiate it, so you'll go ahead. But I mean, if that case, they drop the case, unless everyone, I mean, someone disagrees with me. You get the costs, you are acquitted. Yeah, but all this, uh, the cost is high. I mean, I don't do anything yesterday. Yeah, but wait, are you now in a better position, or if they continued with the case and cost you even more, and they lost, at least they've dropped the claim, right? These are the costs. Yes. Exactly. You can bring, you can make those claim for costs before the arbitral tribunal. And if that is the case, based on the factual scenario you presented, I see no reason for you not getting those costs. You can also request another thing, that the claims are dismissed with prejudice, not without prejudice, to ensure that they will not bring a claim in the future in the same instance. And I think this is the winning point for you. It's not the money. But uh, any other views on this? Keep good time sheets for your internal employees so you have a chance of claiming some of those hours. That's Keep good time sheets for your internal employees so that you can claim those hours. Now, his course is speaking from a jurisdiction that allows you to claim those costs, <laughs> 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 which is not where you're coming from. Uh, for some reason, it reminds me of a uh, Latin sentence, uh, summum jus summa injuria, which means that the, the highest justice is the sum of all injustices. So, I wish to thank you all for your excellent contributions tonight. I benefited a lot, and I'm sure all our colleagues enjoyed your contributions. And uh, I hand it now over to our colleagues, and I thank them for putting this event together, for ensuring that we have a diverse panel and uh, picking such an interesting topic. So all credit goes to you and to our esteemed panelists, and thank you all very much. I would like to show our appreciation to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.